let's say we had the omnipotent AI, so to speak, that was able to, you know, where we turn over the control of the central bank to the AI, we turn over all these other things to the AI. Then the question is, we say to the AI, now do the right thing. What Gödel's theorem shows is that you can, that will never work. That the fact that the universe is a giant computer means that there are features of the universe and things that are going to happen that we'll never be able to predict, even if we use the entire universe to predict it. Because it means that there are things that are going to happen where the only way to find out what's going to happen is just to wait and see. The really meaningful reality is the higher level thing. It is exactly us and our consciousness and so on. And, and whether it's quarks or schmorks or something else is actually quite secondary. We have an existence then which is you know, somewhat substrate independent. And I, I think that's also a very and empowering that's the idea. Mathematics. It works exactly because it's all mathematical, yes. The most effective way of balancing neurochemistry is to balance our lives. Remember, experience changes the brain. And to me, the value of the science is that it increases awareness. So we understand just how powerful those things are and that the time we, we spend with our friends and family is not the stuff we do after we've done the important stuff, that it is the important stuff. This is straight out of math. Complex systems which don't allow optimal self-organization move towards chaos or rigidity. But what was really interesting was that the high achieving groups were not those where they had one or two people with spectacularly high IQ, nor were the most successful groups the ones that had the highest aggregate IQ. He was called the super wolf. He distinguished himself from other wolves because his behavior and his personality were extraordinary. It's even getting so discreet as what you ate for breakfast. So a new technology they're developing now primarily for airports is picosecond lasers. Love this. So this is a laser which can hit everyone in a 50 meter radius and simultaneously, more or less, and uh, figure out what temperature any part of their body is. It can do heart rate, breath rate, and it also detects off-gassing from the body. Um, it can recognize individual kinds of chemicals or components, so it can see if you've got drug residue on your shoe or explosive residue on your hair. It can also see if you have had a lot of coffee for breakfast by, based on how much caffeine is coming out on your breath. Like, incredibly intrusive stuff, but all data that's being gathered en masse, right? Well, what's interesting about the real-world data from this proliferation of sensors, right? The traffic lights are all monitoring you and doing able to do facial recognition, stuff like this. What's interesting about this kind of our future 1984 scenario is that all those real world sensors are having all your data aggregated and sold and traded without you ever knowing it's being obtained. At the same time that latencies are collapsing around the Earth's surface, information generation that's relevant to these market trading uh, and market making activities remains distributed. So these are a couple of my favorite examples. Uh, the first one, not terribly widely known, so UBS, uh, as, uh, as one example of a firm, has recently started mining live satellite photos of retail parking lots to, to figure out and to try to reverse engineer uh, store traffic. Uh, second example, uh, social media mining for, uh, for live trading on the markets, mining sentiment, things like this. These are two of many different examples of why the information generation that's critical to making a profit in the markets is probably going to remain geographically distributed for the foreseeable future. At the same time, we want to reduce latencies uh, and reduce so, spreads. Just like Audrey too, from the Little Shop of Horrors, who, need, who needs blood to grow, these free services need your data to grow. They are not necessarily evil or there is no conspiracy theory but they spy on you because it is their business model to spy on you, right? The business model of free is the business model of corporate surveillance. So you might have heard the saying, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. Well, in this case, I prefer you are the quarry being mined. You are the livestock being farmed. And really, it's not even about your data. Your data is just raw materials. That's what's being mined. It's raw materials for something that's way more valuable, for your profile, 
for the virtual you, the digital self, the simulation of you, your sim that these companies create to understand more about you. Why? Because I can't take you and I can't put you in a lab and prod you. There are laws against that to see how you react to things, to see what your fears are, your ambitions are, right? I can't do that right now because your corporeal self has rights. But if I can simulate you, if I can have enough information about you that I can build a simulation of you, I can put that simulation in a lab and I can prod it and I can psychoanalyze it and I can study it all I want using whatever techniques I, I want because your simulation has no rights under the law today. So that's one of the things that we need to change. We need, this is not just a technical issue. This is also a matter of legislation. So once you have this consensus mechanism, I think this offers a great new opportunity to a new kind of a symbiosis between blockchain and AI. So I talked about AI being conference, a major conference of three major trends. I alluded to, uh, to the computational power, Moore's law, and then possibly quantum computers. I also talked about some new inventions in the uh, algorithm. But what AI needs the most is to have data so that AI can learn. But right now, all data are concentrated as centralized platforms. So there's very little incentive for individuals to con uh, contribute data because they basically get nothing in return and maybe their privacy could even be violated. So I envision the future of the world where the ownership of the data should be completely be returned to the individuals. So all my personal data, all my behavior data, all my online data, all my genomics data, all my medical records, everything should be uh, owned by the individual and the privacy should be completely protected. But then you say, wow, then how can machine possibly learn anything if everybody keeps their secret private? And there is a beautiful thing called privacy preserving computation. And that will make it possible to have a data marketplace. So I first of all protected all my privacy data, but I can leak information out one bit at a time, totally at my control. And uh, such a world will be a data marketplace that individually, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where individually own the, their private data and then there can be a bidding and selling uh, process uh, and very selectively controlled uh, by performing privacy preserving data marketplace. So such a future world of, uh, of uh, marketplace uh, based on one principle which I call in math we trust. Uh, and that is uh, possible that, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, that you can still preserve privacy, uh, but still uh, maintain, uh, uh, and, but still can do computation that uh, only leaks out very, very selectively one in piece of information uh, at a time. So the famous uh, problem is called the secure multi-party computation or a millionaire problem. So obviously private wealth is very, very uh, private. People don't like to reveal. But it could be so happen that two millionaires want to compare uh, who is richer. But without revealing to each other, if they reveal to each other the uh, wealth they have, obviously uh, you, uh, they will find out, but leaks too much privacy data. But there's a computational protocol uh, called Yas, uh, Yas garbled circuit that they can exchange protocol. In the end of the day, they only find out one bit of information, namely who is richer without revealing anything. There's a idea of uh, differential privacy, namely adding noise to private data uh, so that they don't become individually identifiable. But if I want to conduct a collective survey, I can add noise in such a way that in the statistical aggregate, the noise will cancel out. So the statistical information is completely accurate, but no, not much individual private data has been leaked because there's so enough noise that individually identifiable uh, information is not there, but, uh, the, but the overall, uh, uh, overall uh, statistical information is still accurate. And then there's also the idea of zero knowledge proof. I can prove to you, for example, that I solved a very difficult game, let's say the Sudoku game, but I want to only give you one bit of information, namely I solved the game, but I don't want to review you my entire solution. I want you to keep on trying harder. And this is also possible through the zero knowledge proof. So there's really a world where mathematics will enter economics in a very central way. 
uh, in making a data marketplace possible so that we all of us will own our individual data and then uh, Google Cloud and uh, all these uh, entities then can compute uh, in a centralized, uh, they can compute useful statistical <coughs> information without revealing, without him having us to re uh, uh, reveal this privacy data. So I really think about this world where both AI and, uh, and uh, blockchain combined can do great social good in this new era of crypto economic science based on in math we trust. Because when you really think about what's the problem with our society today, it's because there's discrimination against minority. And that is a fundamental of uh, our society. But when you really think about AI learning, let's say if my AI algorithm is already working accurately 90% of the time, but I want some extra data so that I can go from 90% to 99%. The data I need is not yet another kind of data which looks very similar to all the previous data I have seen. I want data which is called to have high mutual entropy, namely the data that's most distinct. And that by definition is owned by the minority. But then in such a data marketplace, I will bid the highest for those data which are most uh, in the minority. So then the economic incentive structure will be aligned. Our society will be value the minority the most. Uh, and that's exactly what we need uh, to do social good. So finally, there's a vision that the ugly duckling can somehow become a beautiful swan. Because the ugly duckling is not ugly, it's different. But uh, now, uh, difference will be valued the most. Minorities in this fair data marketplace will now be discriminated against. So I really see this wonderful new world uh, in a conference of three major trends, quantum computing, AI, and blockchain. But I also see myself being coming from academia and uh, often in interactions uh, with uh, uh, colleagues in industry, uh, we really can enter a new world where the latest scientific idea, it's really, really fascinating and totally amazing that these mathematical concepts was purely invented uh, by uh, mathematicians in abstract, could turn out to be so useful. So something like number theory, uh, every day when we conduct a transaction using HTTPS uses number theory in the most essential way. So this is a wonderful new world where collaboration with academia in the industry can really lead to great progress. Uh, 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 as I said, the greatest opportunity uh, of making progress is oftentimes see a conference of some major trends uh, before in, anyone who is in their specialized area couldn't see the overall picture. And I really think that the symbiosis among these three major trends will be the defining characteristic of the future of information technology. Thank you. So the thing that I'm proposing we do here is that we reach behind us and we grab the dust, that we reach into our bodies and we grab the genotype, and we reach into the medical system and we grab our records, and we use it to build something together, which is a commons. And there's been a lot of talk about commonses right here, there, everywhere, right? A commons is nothing more than a public good that we build out of private goods. We do it voluntarily. We do it through standardized legal tools. We do it through standardized technologies. Right? That's all a commons is. It's something that we build together because we think it's important. And a commons of data is something that's really unique because we make it from our own data. And although a lot of people like privacy as their methodology of control around data and obsess around privacy, at least some of us really like to share as a form of control. And what's remarkable about digital commons is, is you don't need a big percentage if your sample size is big enough to generate something massive and beautiful. So not that many programmers write free software, but we have the Apache web server. Not that many people who read Wikipedia edit, but it works. So as long as some people like to share as their form of control, we can build a commons, as long as we can get the information out. And in biology, the numbers are even better. So Vanderbilt ran a study asking people, uh, we'd like to take your bio samples, your blood, and share them in a biobank. And only 5% of the people opted out. I'm from Tennessee. It's not the most science positive state in the United States of America. But only 5% of people want it out. So people like to share if you give them the opportunity and the choice. And the reason that I got obsessed with this, besides the obvious family aspects, is that I spend a lot of time around mathematicians. And mathematicians are drawn to places where there's a lot of data because they can use it to tease signals out of noise. And those correlations they can tease out, they're not necessarily causal agents, 
But math in this day and age is like a giant set of power tools that we're leaving on the floor, not plugged in in health while we use hand saws. If we have a lot of shared genotypes and a lot of shared outcomes and a lot of shared lifestyle choices and a lot of shared environmental information, we can start to tease out the correlations between subtle variations in people, the choices they make, and the health that they create as a result of those choices. And there's open source infrastructure to do all of so this. To take a step back and look at one of the most exciting recent trends uh, as applies to infrastructure within the financial sector, there's a latency arms race going on in financial networking. So we have global exchanges scattered around the world, and they all want to talk to each other for arbitrage, for market making purposes. And so I'll show you two examples here. Uh, these are the fastest current network routes from Chicago to New York and New York to London. Chicago to New York is, uh, is entirely on land. New York to London is almost entirely through the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and if you take a look at the, the latencies via uh, spread networks and uh, Hibernia Atlantic on the right, uh, these latencies, the round trip delays for sending uh, a packet round trip are actually starting to approach the physical limits allowed for photons traveling through optical fibers around geodesics on the Earth's surface. So for the first time, and this is really only happening in the financial sector, the financial sector is pushing the physical limits of information transmission capabilities around the Earth's surface. And I think that opens up some, some really intriguing opportunities for, uh, for exploiting position on the Earth's surface. Finally, here we see Entropica spontaneously discovering and executing a buy low, sell high strategy on a simulated range traded stock, successfully growing assets under management exponentially. This risk management ability will have broad applications in finance and insurance. So what you've just seen is that a variety of signature human intelligent cognitive behaviors such as tool use and walking upright and social cooperation all follow from a single equation which drives a system to maximize its future freedom of action. Now, there's a profound irony here. Going back to the beginning of the usage of the term robot, the play RUR, R -U -R, there was always a concept that if we developed machine intelligence, there would be a cybernetic revolt. The machines would rise up against us. One major consequence of this work is that maybe all of these decades, we've had the whole concept of cybernetic revolt in reverse. It's not that machines first become intelligent and then megalomaniacal and try to take over the world. It's quite the opposite, that the urge to take control of all possible futures is a more fundamental principle than that of intelligence, that general intelligence may in fact emerge directly from this sort of control grabbing rather than vice versa. So taking another step back and, and realizing that we're stuck on the Earth's surface, at least for the moment, in this geographically uh, distributed trading environment, this is what uh, a typical uh, arbitrage transaction looks like if we think of it as a, an extended space-time event. So you have two locations that are geographically separated and <coughs> trading, even if it's pre-coordinated, needs to be, uh, to some extent, coordinated after the fact, uh, just if, if for no other reason uh, than to maintain uh, capital requirements uh, and to maintain net neutral positions wherever possible in the case of arbitrage transactions. So this is the way things, uh, for the most part, are done right now. And this is the way they can be done. Uh, and so. Various firms in the financial sector are already doing some approximation of this, but until recently there was no universal optimal solution that was known for how best to coordinate trading in multiple locations by positioning yourself in between markets. So to be more concrete, let's say you want to perform trading on both New York exchanges and London exchanges, how do you most efficiently do that in today's latency arms race environment? Uh, and the answer turns out to be to position yourself somewhere in between, at least in network terms, New York and London, so that 
while you're not the first person in the world to hear the latest prices coming off a New York exchange or the London exchange, you are the first to hear the correlations between them. Uh, and you can think about this as a, a sort of financial or, or econophysical analog of reflex arcs uh, in, in vertebrate biology. So if you touch something, your finger pulls away before your brain feels the pain from the heat. And this is because the, the pain signal doesn't have to travel all the way to your brain. It just travels uh, to your spine and your spine sends a signal back to, to, pull, your, uh, to pull your hand back. Same thing here. Uh, if there are trading, if there are arbitrage opportunities, rather than requiring a round-trip transaction, it's possible to position a coordination server at a geographically intermediate location that, uh, that enables trades to be performed more quickly and coordinated more quickly. So this is the, the subject of a, a paper I wrote in Physical Review about a year and a half ago called Relativistic Statistical Arbitrage that uh, solved the universal problem of where to position such coordinating servers. Uh, and the answer turns out to be pretty interesting. Um, I, I'll skip the, the derivation uh, since we're running short on time, uh, and I'll just skip to the results. <laughs> this is the answer. Uh, now, this is a uh, few um, provisos. Uh, this is one representative solution set uh, with lots of assumptions. The solution uh, that I skipped through is actually far more general. Um, but this gives you a flavor of uh, the sort of treasure map that comes from uh, the universal solution. These are just some of the reasons to work on bettering our... Mindset! Dataset! Human Connection! Ha, 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 ha.